share your screen and I want to thank Hans Bloom for uh, presenting uh, super resolution microscopy, a very vast subject uh, to us. And uh, I think uh, so that you're going to introduce yourself on your first slide. Can I so, try? Thank you. Okay, yes. Um, okay, yes, so I will cover the super resolution fluorescence microscopy. And my background is I've been locked into dark rooms building microscopes for the last 25 years. So I did my PhD at the Royal Institute of Technology here in Stockholm. And that was also a collaboration at Karolinska Institute. And then I actually went to Japan and built microscope there for a, a company. And then I joined Stefan Hell's lab in Germany 21 years ago, developing a STED microscopy. And as you know, Stefan shared the Nobel Prize in 2014. So. And then I stole Stefan's uh, technique and brought it to Stockholm mm -hmm. and built up STED microscopy at the Royal Institute of Technology. And uh, since about 12, 13 years, I'm at SciLife Lab, where we have a facility, a national facility where we support with different uh, super resolution microscopy techniques. So if you're in need of uh, getting a little bit better resolution in your images, then just contact me and my staff will help you get better images, hopefully. So let's continue then. So super resolution microscopy, what should you think about? Well, you know, things are small inside cell and super resolution microscopy can help you seeing this a little bit better then. So kind of the goal of uh, using super resolution microscopy is look at small things inside the cell. And here are different examples. So I don't know what your favorite organelle is or what you're studying, but uh, try to apply super resolution microscopy on something that is yeah, a bit small, but not too small. We don't have uh, infinity amount of resolutions. And if you also think about imaging and resolution, uh, the more resolution you have, you can of course see more, but you also need to remember that you usually use methods that are stepwise improvement in resolution. So confocal or structure illumination microscopy, which I tell about, or nanoscopy, which is another kind of word for uh, super resolution microscopy. So here you see a visualization of a structure with different uh, microscopy methods. And of course, each visualization might tell you something, but you cannot conclude everything if you don't have uh, yeah, enough resolutions. And so why the word super? Well, a better microscope is always super. So we can say that as soon as we make a microscope a little bit better, it's a super microscope. And as you have learned from the course here, uh, Abbe kind of coined the uh, uh, diffraction limited resolution in 1872, 1873. So that's the equation you see at the top left corner here, where the lambda is the wavelength and then the two n signs alpha is the collection angle. And the smaller the wavelength, the better you can resolve things and the better objective and collection you can do, you can also resolve things. But so there is of course for live cell uh, microscopy, you cannot go too far uh, below visible wavelength with lambda. And we are technically limited to collect uh, light up to like uh, yeah, 180 degrees or so we are technically limited there on two sides. So therefore there has been a development in the last 100 plus years trying to make microscopy better and better. So here you see some schematics of different methods. So what Abbe kind of used was a wide field a microscope. He did of course not have a CCD camera to detect. He had to use his eyes. And he also didn't have mathematics to decolve images, which can of course now improve on the upper resolution. Then of course, as you remember, uh, confocal microscopy was uh, invented and patented uh, in the mid 1950s or the late 50s. And there you kind of uh, make a small point in space and you detect through a small pinhole and therefore you can actually improve the, the resolution a bit. 
especially you can apply it for good optical sectioning. And the more modern way of doing confocal microscopy is to take it onto an array detector and the small detector element are then used as, as a pinhole. And I will tell you a little bit more about that. And then we're gonna go through what is called a SIM microscopy, that is structure illumination. So you use a structure to illuminate your sample and through the illumination and the pattern of the object, you kind of get interference that carries uh, frequencies at a uh, higher re resolution. And then uh, we can step over to what I learned and 20 plus years in Germany, STED microscopy, where you actually use uh, photophysical uh, laser light to, to turn off uh, fluorescence from, from molecules, and then you can separate them uh, better. And then the last method I'm gonna cover is single molecule localization microscopy where individual blinking molecules are localized and you can pinpoint them with quite high precision. So let's then start going back in time here. So this was the letter that Abbe wrote to the Royal Microscopy Society in London uh, showing that, okay, if we now illuminate our sample at oblique angle, so you see a small figure there and you see that one ray goes at one corner of the lens and then the diffracted light of the sample goes to the other corner of the lens. And that's the highest resolution that, that you can then achieve. And uh, the, you see the equation there for number two. So just by having oblique illumination of your samples, you actually increase the uh, resolving power with a factor of two. So Abbe actually built a, a super resolution microscope many, many years ago before they were illuminated uh, uh, the sample from straight ahead. And then, uh, yeah, you had half of that resolution. So if you then kind of schematically look at what, what Abbe did, he illuminated the sample. He used kind of a grating as a uh, uh, sample then, and then the light goes to each corner of the objective. And that, that's then the collection angle. And then you get a, a magnified image and uh, it, it then can resolve what you maybe didn't see before. And for fluorescence, we just used this, the same principle. So the light actually goes to the corner of the objectives collecting uh, uh, at the highest angle. And then we then get uh, uh, high resolution fluorescence image. So the principles are, are kind of kind of the, the same. And then the first step of kind of improving on uh, resolution was actually done by Marvin Minsky when he patented the, the confocal principle. So he wanted to get better images actually in, in neuro neuroscience and especially getting optical sectioning. So he illuminated with the point source and then he detected with the point source. And if you then uh, try to look at the focus sizes through a pinhole, so you have the emission and the emission size is shown there in the lower part as the point serve function. And then you go through uh, the pinhole and you can set the pinhole size to, to different uh, sizes. And then of course you have illumination side, which is also, so to speak, a, a point sparing fraction. And if you now multiply these and the pinhole is made kind of smaller and smaller, you can actually get uh, a higher resolution in your, in your image. So don't be afraid of actually, when you have a confocal microscope to, to close down the pinhole. So you can go down to quite small values if you have a good good sample that is well stained. So then don't be afraid of closing down the pinhole because you will actually improve on the resolution. What you will of course uh, lose is um, light that being uh, collected. So at the top uh, graph here, you see if you have a fully open pinhole to the left, you see quite a lot of uh, glow that is the optical section is of course not very good here. The, the, the signal is of course strong on those lines. But if you close down the pinhole, you get uh, improved optical section, but you're also improving the resolution, even though you see that uh, yeah, the structures that you look at is getting fainter and fainter. And this has been known for many, many, many years. So uh, actually it was a publication in the 1980s saying that, yeah, if we close down the pinholes, we can improve the resolution. 
And uh, Colin Shepard actually published an article where you close down the pinhole and use an ar array detector that where each uh, array element is like as a pinhole, then you can actually improve the resolution. So at the lower graph there, that's uh, Colin's uh, publication. So you can actually kind of un understand that if you have a uh, excitation spot and then a pinhole and the pinhole is slightly shifted a bit, then the overlap with the excitation PSF and the detection PSF is of course becoming, becoming actually smaller. And what you actually then need to do is, as the pinhole is a bit shifted, you need to shift back the, the image where you, so to speak, uh, measured on what pixel you measured. And this is the whole principle behind, behind what is today dubbed from different microscopy vendors from size that's called Ariscan and uh, from uh, Nikon, they call it the spark detector and things like that. So array detectors uh, can be used as uh, small pinholes and uh, by then uh, moving back the image information, you can then uh, generate uh, higher resolution. So here is the principle behind uh, how uh, the array detector or this uh, multi-pixel detector is incorporated in a size microscope, but it's exactly the same in, in a Nikon microscope or other vendors. So you just illuminate your sample and you can then select if you want to be in a confocal mode where you have a, a physical pinhole in front of the detector, or you can uh, send your light to this uh, array detector and then the array detector is used as uh, small pinholes and then a bit of processing shift those uh, detected parts into this to the center and you then improve the resolution about uh, yeah 40 percent or so so i wanted to stop here so you can ask questions regarding the introduction. We have uh, several people who have uh, uh, Ariscan microscopes, right? So I wonder if anyone has, of you has used it before, the Ari detector. I have a question for the audience. Why did it take almost like 30 years before Colin Shepard published the idea until we saw microscopes on the market. You mean the idea of closing the pinhole or the idea of the confocal? Uh, the array detector. Mm. So here's the answer. In 1988, you could hardly store 500 kilobytes of data on your computer. And now Colin uh, invented a array detector. So. <laughs> 16 times more information or 32 times more information. So there were no computers around really to to, to use the information or that could be used to information. So we had to wait for actually better kind of computers and also maybe detectors. So, okay, let's continue then. Um, so. Yes, so save the questions then. Um, okay, so now I will step on in this uh, super resolution landscape. As you then know, Abbe kind of coined the diffraction limit and we were kind of stopping at around two, 300 nanometer of resolving things. But in cell biology, there are of course things that are smaller than those uh, few hundred nanometers even though a confocal resolution and ARI scan or this array confocal is, is quite good. So it's, you can see very small things, but we would of course like to go to even smaller scales. So therefore I'm going to talk to about uh, Simstead and uh, single molecule localization microscopy. I will not cover what is a very modern method called Minflux or Minstead, where you actually go down to sub 10 nanometer uh, resolutions. Um, but then let's look at an article published by Mats Gustafsson, who was one of the pioneerings in the single uh, structure elimination microscopy. 
So he wrote the following. Uh, the classical resolution is imposed by physical laws, but you can circumvent this. For example, there is assumptions in, uh, uh, in the things that uh, led up to Abbe's uh, resolution uh, equation. For example, a single objective lens was used. The excitation light was uniform through the sample and uh, emission process were uh, linear. So if you change any of these uh, assumption, for example, using two objectives, you can improve the resolution. Or if you play around with the excitation light that is not uniform, you could also improve the resolution. And if you then also uh, play around with uh, affecting the emission processes, uh, for example, switching things off and on, then you can also improve the resolution. So it's all down to some assumptions that we, we can, so to speak, define the classical resolution limit. And all of these methods have, of course, been tested. People have been building microscope with four objectives. I've even seen theoretical publication with six objectives. And uh, let's then start with the first uh, method here, if you would change your illumination light. So normally, if you would look down in your microscope with your uh, fluorescent lamp on or your just bright light, then it's an even, even illumination on your, on your cell. But if you now have a striped illumination and you rotated this in different directions, there will actually be an interference between the illumination and the structure of the sample. And by doing this, you will actually increase increase the resolution on, on, on your wide field microscope, the camera based microscope. You need to illuminate with stripes and then you need to process out, so to speak, the stripe from your image. And then you can crisp up your image with a, actually a factor of two compared to confocal resolution. And you also have optical sectioning. And here is then how you should kind of think about this. So you have a sample where a structure is kind of hidden. Now, of course, you can see a little bit of the structure there. It's weakly and so. And now you illuminate this with the, the striped illumination. And if you overlap those two, then you get what is called a moiré pattern. And now you see something really cool. You start seeing a broad uh, band that are well separated uh, on the scale here. And you also see some kind of uh, wiggly structure in the middle there. So now the information of the sample is in this, what I call the, the image. And as the structures are kind of broader and well separated, the microscope will see this. So it carries information about uh, the higher resolution. And now we need to process out how we have uh, illuminated in the microscope. So this is also from, from then, uh, the early uh, publication of explaining uh, structure illumination microscopy. So normally you just illuminate with a, with a light that is homogeneous. That's kind of the top graph there. And then you get a cutoff in, in your microscope that you, you, you cannot see any more resolution than, than that the cutoff then. But if you now add a frequency or spatula frequency in your, in your sample illuminating with stripes, then those stripes carries down information from, from higher frequencies, higher spatial frequencies. That meaning is uh, things that are finer in structures. And if you then do mathematical and, and putting back those uh, frequencies where they came from, then you improve the resolution. And does this work? Yeah, it works quite well. So if you have a normal wide field microscope, of course, you resolve there down to the upper resolution limit. You sit on a bit of uh, out of focus glow here. And then if you add the same method, you start to crisp up the structure and you also see that you have optical sectioning. And here are some other examples that we used the uh, SIM microscope to support users looking at neurons. Uh, confocally, you resolve uh, the neurons quite well in the spines, but if you then use SIM, you, you crisp up this structure even, even better. So it can help for st structures if you need a bit more uh, resolution here, uh, the factor of, factor of two. And uh, a factor of two, that sounds kind of small, 
But if you would have a microscope that had a resolution of say two meters, all people on the planet, yeah, except for basketball players maybe, would be then two meter in the image. But if you improve the resolution two times and you can resolve one meter, then you would also find a new species on this planet called children. So a factor of two can give quite a, a lot of insight into biology. And we have applied this method to support uh, users. People are looking at bacteria. Bacteria are kind of small and a bit more resolution helps. Uh, In-house, we have uh, run a project looking at synaptonemal complexes that kind of uh, keep the, the chromatin in the nucleus during uh, uh, division and uh, things like that kind of organized. And they are kind of small. So I call them non-railways. And the sim uh, helps resolving this. So here is then a summary of sim. You get two times better resolution in 3D. Multicolor is, is uh, built into it. So it's in principle just a camera-based uh, system where you have a normal wide field illumination, but now in the form of stripes. The field of view is... Yeah, depending on what you think is big or small, but now we're talking super resolution microscopy with 100 nanometer resolution in, in the in the focal plane. So you can at least see a, a whole cell there. And there is um, uh, development on trying to go larger fields of the view here. And the method is kind of uh, good as you can use your old cell labeling protocol that you were talking about uh, maybe uh, the week before here about sample preparation and so immunolabeling and putting on the right dice. Uh, of course, the speed then of course comes at the cost here because you need to move those stripes over the sample and you need to turn them so you get a higher resolution in, in all direction. So usually you need to take nine to 15 uh, images per focal plane and then process that. And then, of course, as in all sample preparation, you need a good contrast, as it is a wide field method. And regarding the processing, you need to think about uh, not introducing rendering artifacts. And live cell uh, imaging is, is possible, as it is a wide field method. But of course, you cannot study too fast uh, processes with it, as you need to move the stripes or the pattern across the, the sample. There has been improvement on, on the speed for the later commercial system. So, so yes, again, I was thinking about asking you questions or stopping here regarding SIM microscopy. I forgot to download. Has anyone uh, tried? We have a SIM microscope at our facility. We also have Spark. And I know that some people are using um, some sort of uh, a super resolution microscopy, right? But then I want to ask again, has anyone tried the, uh, the uh, ARI scan? I have it under my uh, I have never tried. You never tried? <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering oh, yeah. if it would be useful for me, actually. Yeah, it depends on what you want to look at and how much resolution you want and things like that. But it will give you uh, like 40% better resolution than Confocal. Uh, but of course, you can just use a Confocal and closing down the pin node. So don't be afraid of closing it down, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm detecting RNA. Yeah, the molecular RNA. So okay. I'm looking at the point of focal, but I have Yeah, I mean, then of course you're looking at something that is uh, very sparse, which of course can help on one side, but then you're usually limited by uh, the contrast. As you cannot put too much uh, fluorescence on the on the RNA. Uh, of course, you can have oligos and things like that mm -hmm. and then then you usually need to work on the on the background issue trying to low lower that one in order to see what you want to see so yeah. i'm only talking in this presentation basically about 
the parameter resolution. But of course, in any microscope image, the contrast is, yeah, I, I would say it's even more important than resolutions. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's We've continue. had quite a lot of discussion about sample preparation and <laughs> and the implication of contrast uh, uh, with resolution. So. Yes. Infinity was... resolution with zero contrast is a very bad <laughs> image. <laughs> yes. So okay. Let's continue here to the next acronym. And here actually Stefan then appears. So Stefan was actually a postdoc in 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 Finland in Turku. I think you're not sharing your screen anymore. Oh, okay. I'm not sharing my screen anymore. And I have to click share screen again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Yes. Yes. Here we go. Stefan. Here, yes. Thank you. So as I said, Stefan was a postdoc in, in, in Finland several years ago. And then he realized that, yes, for essence microscope, we can actually make them better. So here you see a schematic of like a lens focusing into the sample. And then because of the wavelength and things like that, you cannot make uh, too small of a focus. So it's usually a few hundred nanometers uh, lateral. And then even worse for us that want to resolve 3D biology, it's actually a factor of three to four bigger than that numbers. So if you put molecules inside this focal volume, you will not be able to separate them. But then Stefan realized that, yes, we can actually improve the resolution. And in his uh, uh, first publication, he wrote there that optical resolution is unlimited because one can non-linearly deplete fluorescence to generate smaller focal volume. So what does that actually mean? Well, Stefan wanted to do this. He wanted to build this microscope. So somehow he wanted to select uh, out a part of the focus and have molecules all on on that uh, voxel and turning off the other molecules and therefore they could be separated. And how was this done then? Yeah, well, actually he re realized that he could use what is called a stimulated emission to do this. So here are a schematic of how it would look like with the energy levels inside of fluorescent molecules. So at the top row there, you send in a green photon. That is your 488 laser, for example. And that is now absorbed by the dye molecule that you have labeled your sample with. And this is called a stimulated absorption. So the energy is absorbed by the dye molecule and it goes up to a higher energy level. And from there, it kind of uh, waits a while until it then falls down back into the ground state. And then it uh, emits uh, orange photon, a little bit uh, longer wavelengths. So this is kind of like uh, you being uh, kicked up standing on a, on a table. And after a while, you wiggle down and fall down to the ground, screaming out your name. So this is the principle of stimulated absorption and spontaneous emission. Then actually Albert Einstein 100 years ago, he realized that, okay, if we had, could have this stimulated absorption process that is, so to speak, going up, it should also be possible to force the system going down by light. And that is called stimulated uh, emission. So you're kind of forcing the excited system to go down. And that on the lower graph there, you see a red photon being sent in and that red photon now matched the energy gap between the uh, excited energy levels and the ground state levels. And that process is now forces the, ex the excited system to go down to the ground state and out comes then a copy of this red photon. And that is the stimulated emission process, which is also the same process that occurs in a laser where you kind of amplified light. So there is of course a fourth process here that I haven't a picture and that is spontaneous absorption. That is mean that the molecule just by absorbing energy in the surrounding jumps up to the excited state. But the, that doesn't happen for the fluorescent molecules that we usually use uh, uh, in our labs. So then St uh, Stefan was actually reading a book on quantum optics where this stimulated emission process was occurring. And then he invented uh, his microscope. So here you see a schematic of a very simple microscope. It's a 1D microscope. So at the top left there, you see the focus. 
and you see the molecules that you want to separate. And in a normal uh, focus, all of these uh, are, so to speak, merged into the same image. If you now use a stimulated emission uh, process, that means you add a red uh, laser and you sculpture it to have a zero in the center. Then that laser will, so to speak, deplete uh, the fluorescence out in the, in the uh, corners there because those molecules, after they have been uh, excited, they are depleted down to the ground states. So they don't emit, uh, emit the spontaneous uh, fluorescence anymore. And there you can see that you improve the resolution. If you now crank up the stead power even more, uh, more molecules at the side of the center is then turn, turned off. They are not spontaneously fluorescent anymore. And therefore you can improve the resolution here by a factor of four to five. So you only need to add an uh, extra laser into your uh, system. And you see the emission spectra uh, and the absorption spectra there of a typical dye. So you add a stead laser out in the red part of the emission spectra to do this uh, switching off. Does it work? Yeah, it actually works quite good. You just have to turn on the stead laser and you uh, have a normal confocal microscope. Uh, and then you get uh, yeah, a raw super resolution microscopy image right away. And here you see some uh, protein in the mitochondrial and, and the confocal everything is kind of merged because it's not uh, resolved enough. But in the steady image, you, you start seeing the topology of the TOM20 protein and also the cytoskeleton, the actin meshwork is, is resolved better then. And we have uh, supported several scientists with, with stead microscopy. Uh, here there were some centriole uh, researcher from, from Denmark that came and wanted some higher resolution. And you can see from the confocal image, you see that there is a centriole there. And uh, in the stead image, you actually start to see that there's some kind of symmetry of this uh, protein being, being labeled in this case. And I don't know exactly what your favorite uh, question is, but uh, here we support uh, a, a PI that wanted to look at uh, cytoskeleton proteins and also focal adhesion proteins. And those uh, structure can then uh, be resolved better with stead microscope. Uh, immunolabeling is, is used for this and uh, a suitable uh, stead dye. And uh, if you combine uh, sculpturing the stead laser pattern like a donut laterally and then uh, lobes above and below the, the normal focus, you can actually do 3D uh, stead microscopy because then you shrink the focal volume in all three uh, directions. So stead microscopy, you get four to five times better resolution. Uh, you can also get that in 3D. You can do multicolor imaging. Uh, I write here three to four and then, yeah, e easy. It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not very easy, but it's doable. You just need to label your uh, structure with uh, stead suitable dyes. Those dyes are usually very photostable and are matched to the stead uh, wavelength that the commercial system has. Uh, yes, regarding speed, of course, if you now have four to five times better resolution, that means that your pixel in the image, of course, has to be matched too. So instead of having maybe 80, 90 nanometer pixels, you then go down to maybe 20 or, or 15 or something like that. That means, of course, if you would have the same field of view for a confocal, and then it would, of course, take four to five times longer every line you go through there. So, so therefore, you usually zoom in on the sample. Uh, the field of view is then a bit small, maybe. But if you want to look at mitochondria and you see 10 mitochondria, then of course n is equal to 10. So when you shrink your focal volume, of course, you detect less and less molecules. So you're going to go a bit contrast limited in instead microscopy. And live cell imaging is possible, but challenging. You, of course, need to get your uh, uh, labels into the, into the cell 
So you need to use cell parameter or a dice and maybe yeah, some kick chemistry or things like that. And again, I just wanted to stop here if you have any questions. So we actually have one student who uses that. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. uses instead on uh, an Olympus microscope, I think. Okay. Right. Um, I currently use instead microscopy. I actually try to resolve uh, cytoskeleton proteins inside the cells on the organelles on the lipid droplets. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you could have a visit uh, to Hans' facility and. Uh have a discussion and maybe learn a lot from him. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> yeah, you're always welcome to, to contact us. That's that's our job. So yeah, right. Thank you. Yes. Okay, let's continue then. Uh, share presentation. So Recap, very fast recap. Uh, here, we're going to go to the next acronym. Single molecule localization microscopy. Yes. So what does that mean? Well, if you imagine you have your normal kind of uh, focus in the microscope, you see that to the left. It's, it's kind of a, a blob. And if you would have a molecule inside this blob and detect it on the camera, you would see like a spot. Uh, and across that intensity is like a small mountain. And if you now make the assumption that, okay, my molecule that I'm detecting is sitting in the center of this uh, blob, then you can use mathematics to, to, to fit this profile and get a localization point with higher precision uh, inside this blob. So you, you kind of mathematically pinpoint uh, the center of gravity of, of, the, of the detection here. And if you have very, very good signal, then of course you can understand that you can fit this uh, center quite well. So the precision can, can go up almost like a, a factor of 10. Uh, and that's the principle behind single molecule localization uh, procedure. But of course, now we only have to have one molecule inside this because we cannot separate molecules. So that, that means kind of a daunting task of just looking at single molecules per focal volume. And this is then how it looked like on, on a camera. You're gonna uh, have a system where you actually turn on and off molecule. Uh, so that therefore you can tune the, the concentration of what is on. So by using this on off process, then you can be sure that per focal volume, you only have one molecule on at uh, each event. In a normal image, you would have everything on at the same time and then you cannot separate it. So here again, there is this uh, switching of on and off, which was actually why they shared the Nobel Prize uh, in 2014, because you can actually turn off on and off molecules. So here we have labeled neurons, uh, with a fluorescent protein that we can actually switch on and off with the uh, UV light. And then we can read out its uh, fluorescence with uh, with green excitation light. And you see those blinks on the camera and you need to measure for quite a long time in order to extract all, all blinks. But when you're then done with that series and you pinpoint the central gravity of each of these blinks. And at the top right there, you see along the the dendrite, you see the spine structures, and we had here labeled the sodium potassium ATPase protein that is the, the, the pump sitting in the in the membrane. And you actually see how it's distributed along the dendrite, up in the in the neck, and also in the in the spine. Overlaid there to find the synaptic structure is a wide field image of the postsynaptic 95 density. And then from each of these spine heads or structures, you can then plot how many events did we then see and how were they distributed. So at the lower right there, you kind of see uh, a lot of small dots that are, so to speak, the localization of individual molecules. 
pinpointed, their center of gravity. So uh, the first person that kind of made this work was Eric Betzig, and he shared the Nobel Prize then with, with Stefan in 2014. And he dubbed his method uh, photoactivable localization microscopy, PALM. So the principle here was to label a structure with a fluorescent protein that could be switched on by UV light. So the first problem was nothing was fluorescence in the, uh, so you couldn't find the sample in fluorescent mode. So you had to go to a, a different mode in order to find the sample. But then the first uh, frame, you turned on a few molecules and those that were then on could then be read out by exciting them and measuring the fluorescence. And then you pinpoint their center of gravity. And then those molecules were photo bleached, uh, yeah. And you can then activate a new set. And you repeated this for like 20,000 frames or 300,000 frames. So the first measurements in 2005 took actually nine hours for them. Uh, and then they published this in science in 2006. So then of course, uh, there are a lot of different uh, molecules that you can use for this method. So there are a group that could, uh, they are just called photoactivable. They go from like a, a non fluorescent state over to a fluorescent state. So therefore you can turn them on and read them out. There are also photo convertible where you can actually see the sample then in, in green, you convert the, uh, the fluorescent molecules to red and then you read it out individually. Or there are really advanced uh, photo switchable fluorescent protein where you can activate them and deactivate them and you can cycle that a bit back and forth. So there's a, a whole list of different uh, fluorescent protein that can do this uh, palm method. And here is the data then actually from, from Eric's uh, uh, early publication. The use of fluorescent microscope where they went into turf mode. So they only excited a, a very thin uh, kind of pancake a few hundred nanometers from the from the surface and then they started blinking and then they uh, localized the individual uh, molecules that I found there and then they uh, rendered this in a synthetic image where you kind of visualized where are these uh, molecules then localized and here you see that uh, you have a 10 times better resolution compared to uh, the, the other resolutions. And when you're doing this, if you look at the camera, your raw image looked yeah, kind of noisy. You see a few events on per camera frame and they need to be separate, well separated because they cannot overlap. Uh, and then you do some processing here, you filter out background and you can kind of find where are your molecules. And then the very, very nice Gaussian profile I showed you in the beginning, there is of course not exactly what you're gonna see in the raw data, but you then fit this and figure out the center of gravity of this and how precise you can do this. And then you do the synthetic uh, mapping of those coordinate. A long list of coordinate then generates your image. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously to the fluorescent protein invention, actually Chao Wei Chung at Harvard and Marcus and uh, Marcus Sauer and his uh, co-worker in Germany, they they actually saw that you could also blink uh, synthetic dyes. So normal uh, chemical dyes that you attach to antibodies, if you shine light on them in your image, you usually see that kind of bleaching or, or fading. But if you throw on quite a lot of uh, excitation light plus changed environment of these dye molecules with uh, different uh, redox buffer, you can make them blink. So individually they will appear per frame. Then. And then you can again use the same method uh, schematically shown there on the top. A few molecules are activated, they are localized and then this process is repeated 10,000 times or 20,000 times. And then a synthetic map of the coordinates is, is, is done. So uh, this is also one method. And uh, Xiao Wei's group at Harvard, they dubbed this method STORM, Stochastical uh, Optical Reconstruction Microscope. And as we have a blinking uh, microscope in the facility, we can support you with Palm or, or Storm. 
And here we have labeled immunolabeled again, these synaptonema complexes. So my colleague, uh, Anna Agostino, she has used uh, STORM here, uh, dual color STORM, and see now this uh, non arrayed way that is organized. And one uh, interesting uh, finding here was that there was a difference between the, the male chromosome organization, synaptonema complex, and, and the females. And we have actually also supported um, uh, from the, from Silvis, uh, uh, yeah, a group there in uh, in Huddinge, Stefan Sternberg likes to look at um, focal adhesion, and then as we can also support with uh, other method, we can also combine and compare uh, Stead and Storm and Confoco. And in this case, you see a dual color. Uh, imaging of uh, integrin subunits, activated and non-activated. And confocally, you see that they are kind of merged in the focal adhesion. Instead, you start just resolving the, the activated and non-activated parts. And with STORM, you uh, improve it uh, a little bit more with the resolutions. And then I will cover uh, uh, another method where you actually use single molecule uh, events, but you're uh, doing uh, binding. So instead of uh, switching uh, with photophysics, activating fluorescent molecules and so on, you use the kinetics of binding to induce links. So here you see a schematic of uh, a cell that has a receptor, and then you have like uh, labeled a ligand. And uh, when the ligands then uh, swim around in the solution, it kind of just contribute to a small hazy background. But when it binds, it gets stuck on the receptor and it sits there for, for a few camera frames. So it's, it's, it's like a lighthouse and docking down onto the cell. And after a while, it then uh, uh, unbinds. While it sits there, of course, it can move. So you can then actually use this method as uh, kind of a tracking method too. And it's either iron binds or, or bleach, and then a new event can come. So therefore you have this on off switching by binding in this case. And this uh, was dubbed uh, paint in, the, in 2006, when a researcher used this method to look at uh, uh, lipid organization in, in cell membranes. And one of the more modern ways of doing paint is to use uh, DNA oligos, where there is an immature strain in the solution with the short oligo, and then there's a complementary strain uh, attached, in this case, just to a non-oligo, but they are uh, can be attached to antibodies, and then you can label the, the biology of interest. So again, here you see kind of a, a surface with individual binding events, and then the ion binds uh, over time, and so new ones comes. And we have used this method to, to super resolve different things. So uh, my colleague Daniel has made this uh, DNA paint image on, on tubulin, comparing the, the wide field resolution then to the uh, single molecule localization microscopy resolution. And as I said, if you attach these um, uh, DNA oligos to antibodies, you can use them, them with to complementary docking strings for the immature that is swimming around in the solution and then binds and you get this on-off possibilities. And here again, a neuron is, is labeled uh, and you see the topology of where the umpire is is sitting along the dendrite and in, in the spine. So this is taken from a, from a French group doing this research. Yes, summary, single molecule localization microscopy. You get seven to eight times better resolution. You can also do this in 3D. The field of view then, yeah, of course, uh, to blink a lot of molecules takes a long time. So you kind of usually have small field of views where you also have homogeneous illumination. So you have the same uh, switching kinetics when you do uh, palm and storm. Uh, it's a little bit easier with maybe a DNA paint where you don't have to play around with the uh, laser. Uh, excitation powers and activation powers. 
but then of course you sit on a bit slow binding kinetics. So usually the imaging can take here yeah, tens of minutes before you're collected several tens of thousands of links. You of course understand that you need a little bit of special labeling, but some of the very common dye molecules, Alexa 647, for example, can blink in, in buffers. So, so, so you don't have to invent the new dye. You just need to change a little bit the, the imaging protocols, and things like that. And then of course, a single molecule needs to stand out there against the background. So it's like being an astronomer in the day you only see one star. But if you can work with your background and get that very low, then of course a single molecule would stand out. And then as you realize, depending on what kind of analyzing method you're doing to pinpoint your localization, you, you might get uh, different uh, answers. So again, questions on single molecule localization microscopy. I wonder if anyone has uh, tried storm or palm before. Uh, I mean, it is usually a bit of work to go in this direction, but we, we support your projects. And yeah, since 2013, we support quite a lot of people actually. I have actually a question. I, I wonder, so we have a problem, let's say, or not a problem, but uh, a little difficulty to convince people to put their sample on the cover slip. So cl clearly, I think on, uh, on maybe on storm as well. I don't know. Do you when when people need to do antigen retrieval, uh, they usually do horrible things to their sample, and uh, and the samples tend to detach from the slide that they put them on because they put these uh, super super frost plus uh, slides. And so there are no super frost plus cover slips. And I'm just wondering if in your facility you have uh, issues with people having to do antigen retrieval, the sample detaching and not being able to put the sample on the cover slip instead of on the slide. Well, as I kind of showed you in the beginning, when you think about super resolution microscopy, you kind of think about uh, cell culture. Going into the tissue regime and doing super resolution pos is is possible, but you need to work quite a lot there on the on the sample preparation. Uh, you could, for example, have EM preparation very thin slice, and then uh, immunolabeling those. That has been uh, shown and tested in our in our facility. But if you really go for kind of normal <laughs> thickness of slide, I don't know, anything from a few microns up to tens of microns, we we have always then uh, applied uh, clearing in order to get super resolution to work. So maybe you listened to David's lecture last week where he yes. was clearing an expansion. So, so just And then the taking... sample was also on the cover slip. Uh, yes, it's very it, important, or, isn't it, or? it? It was kind of a chunk of uh, I call it meat microscopy, so a few hundred microns of cleared uh, tissue, and then that was kind of placed onto the cover slipped hole there. But sometimes you glue it with agarose, or you put another cover slip on top of it, and then a bit of uh, yeah something pressing it down or so. Yeah, but yeah, I guess it's like if you have a thick tissue, you can transfer it to the cover slip after you've done all your labeling and stuff. If you have cells, you can seed them on the cover slip. But if you have thin sections, then it's pretty much impossible to transfer them after you have collected them. And there is the problem we have because that's what we are imaging. Yeah, exactly. And if you listen to David's talk, actually, if you do the clearing and keep the volume and measure in the whole volume, then you don't have to do that very, very tricky uh, retrieval and the cutting and in the pin set trying to fish up these things that you have ripped apart and place it on the cover slip. So, so, so there you kind of avoid very much uh, tedious work and uh, destroying, pouring whatever toluene or mm. nasty chemicals on there. So, but if you just take tissue and try to do super resolution microscopy, usually you sit on a high background, which makes it difficult 
with any super resolution method actually. Mm. So, yes. Um, okay, let's continue. So, where are we? We need to share here again. Share. And recap, fast recap. And are here. Yes, so now I covered the modalities that I kind of wanted to, to cover. And if you want to learn more, actually, uh, in September, we are having a PhD course where we actually cover uh, some super resolution microscopy and also other modalities that we support in the facility, light sheet, FCS, things like that. So if you want to learn more about the super resolution techniques, also seeing them demoed and discuss your own project. And at the Friday, the 13th, uh, uh, a fit date, uh, we have a symposium then the, the, where, where we will invite speakers on super resolution microscopy. So book that in your calendar and contact uh, Stefan Venman, my colleague, he's the, heading this course then. So more information will come during the, the spring. Uh, and then of course, if you have projects, apply for project support in our facility because uh, the SciLife uh, facility, we are supposed to be a national uh, hub to support uh, molecular bioscience. So here you see to the left, uh, a typical user. He is also the king of Sweden. So he came by and did a stead microscope experiment. So Linda helped the king with that. Um, in the center, you see uh, Linnea staring down in our state microscope uh, and to the right you see a few guys there. Some of them got the diploma and a medal and one guy uh, lost out on the Nobel Prize there. So, so just apply for support in our portal. You go to nmi.scilifelab.se and the NMI acronym stands for the National Microscopy Infrastructure. So we are several facilities in Sweden actually uh, that supports you. And uh, Silvis facility will join into this network uh, yeah, soon too, I think. Uh, yes, so here we are at the facility. So you see me and Anna, we take care of what I covered kind of today. Uh, Storm, uh, Paul, Stead, uh, Sim. Then of course, we also try to expand samples. You have an ex expansion microscopy. Uh, I think maybe David mentioned some of that before. Uh, Stefan, he is taking care of uh, correlation spectroscopy, trying to follow dynamics and things like that, doing uh, FRET and FCS instead of FCS and uh, other methods. And Steve, he is our guy where you want to go uh, meet microscopy, looking at uh, cleared uh, tissue or, or or organs or you know, even organisms. And then he will do light sheet microscopy and also volumetric uh, lattice light sheet microscope where you can kind of film uh, cell volume quite quite fast with uh, high resolution. So what we will then help you with if you contact us is of course your project. And you kind of have to have a working uh, protocol generating very good uh, wide field confocal images. So that's kind of the starting point to, to approaching us. Uh, and you want then a little bit better resolution. And then the question is, yeah, how many colors do you want? What you're actually going to resolve? You want to go fixed, which is like yeah, ninety percent, ninety-five percent of all project cells of tissue, and then the method kinds. So to the right, you see a confocal image and a steady image of nuclear pore complexes. That was actually the image that was put on the Nobel Prize poster. And there they use stead, and in in the stead image, it actually starts seeing how proteins are localized in those nuclear pore complexes. But you're, you're probably not interested in that, but you have some kind of question that needs a bit better resolution. So, so then approach us. And then we will go through the different methods. And uh, for example, STED, what dye should we select? So here you see a list, uh, Lexa 404488 is a common dye you're probably used to. There are some other dye names here that you might never heard about, but they are they are not from Mars. It's just that they have 
slightly different spectra or more photostability than what you may be used to. And then you can follow sample preparation protocols from different vendors, and we will share all this knowledge with you and figuring out, okay, how, how should we set up your project in order to be successful using SIM or using STED or, or maybe even going down to the single molecule localization microscopy method. And as I said, you can do live cell imaging here. Uh, uh, PI in our group, Ilaria Testa, uh, she applied uh, cell perimetral dyes here that went in and bind to the actin skeleton and confocally you don't see this periodic structure but instead you actually see it and yeah depending on what you're interested in i don't know uh, the nucleus is of course quite compact and 3d dense it's a very tough environment to, to actually resolve but you can try to look at different structures in the nucleus using different methods and here is a small comparison between different methods. And uh, as you can kind of see, resolution improves, but usually the more resolution you get, the uh, contrast is also lowering. So, uh, yes, so, and then images, then of course, always a bit of an illusion depending on yeah, what you try to resolve. You're going to get different information from different methods, as I pinpointed in the beginning. And then, as you had already discussed in this course, actually, sample preparation is, uh, to me, it's more crucial than, <laughs> than the microscope itself. So, so with conventional imaging, the sample can be a bit yeah, nasty, distorted, because you're going to be limited anyway by, by the tools. So... But if you really want to go super resolution, then the sample needs to be perfect. And schematically, this is shown at the lower graph here that uh, labeling density then of course needs to increase if you have high resolution. Uh, this is of course not needed if you have five times or 10 times worse resolution, then uh, you, won't, you won't see this artifact. But when the resolution increase, you're actually going to start seeing that your microtubular is not really kind of continuous. It's uh, it's kind of dotty. So you need to work on your on your labeling approach, uh, titrating, and uh, seeing that uh, it's really well labeled, and of course removing backgrounds. And then of course continuing on the sample preparation which I have not really focused on in this talk, depending, of course, on your sample preparation, you might distort your structure or you might even help getting a better imaging by flattening your structure. So it depends on, are you after topology or are you just after to finding something or, or yeah, quantifying something. So you need to think about the sample preparation there. Uh, and then when we're discussing super resolution and labeling, you of course understand that if you increase your resolution of five to even up to 10 times, then you're approaching a situation that the label that you're detecting is the fluorescent molecule. And that sits a bit away from the epitope, the protein of interest. So therefore, if you're increasing the resolution, your, your image will of course then also be slightly shifted from where you actually have your protein of interest. Okay, sorry. Yes, so this is then schematically showing this. So in a simulation, you assume that you have two protein localized on top of each other, and they are separated by 100 nanometers. So then ideally, your, your image would look like uh, green, red gives you yellow. But now, of course, in a confocal microscope, you would get a yellow image. But of course, this is not trustworthy as the structure was 100 nanometers separate and you cannot separate it. Uh, if you then would switch to a stead with 40 nanometer resolution or so, you could see this, uh, but then maybe the labeling is gonna give you an, an illusion that, yeah, it looks like two parts of this image where the molecules are localized on the same spot, but uh, there's a shift of the antibody sticking out 20 nanometer in different direction on some other spots. Um, yes, and that was a bit of sample preparation and discussion on that. I have not covered at 
all in this talk anything about uh, image processing or uh, deconvolution processes or, or tricks actually to use uh, known information or model to kind of uh, synthetically improve the resolution. That has been a huge work on that for many, many, many years too. And uh, you will listen to Eric after lunch doing a bit of imaging processing. So I have not covered that at all. But this, of course, goes hand in hand that if you can improve your your microscope and understand your microscope, how it works, really good. And then you can apply uh, imaging formation processes to improve their solution. Then, then you can really have a powerful uh, tool if now your sample is, is made perfect. And there is a huge drive on this uh, uh, improving the resolution by uh, deconvolution processes. And the, this is a kind of late uh, or, or new publication where they actually play around with uh, different constraints, uh, sparse deconvolution and uh, continuity. So you know a bit about how your structure should look like, and then you can process that into into the information and improve the resolutions. Uh, and this, of course, becoming more and more popular as not every lab has a SIM microscope or a STED microscope or a single molecule localization microscopy. And then you apply this to your wide field microscopes. And I have not covered at all, which I actually then do with the data afterwards, because just taking a pretty image is, is not what we should use microscopy for. It's actually to try to understand biology a bit more. And with this single molecule localization method, you have a lot of information actually about uh, yeah, what the sample is, is, is telling you. Distributions, uh, you can count things, you can kind of classify things and you can do that with uh, many of these methods, but I have not covered this at all. So this should be a talk by, yeah, I don't know how much Gisela will cover in a few days, but uh, this is of course very important, the imaging processing and the image quantification, because this should be planned in every project. What do you want to measure and what do you want to extract actually? Not just a pretty image. Yeah, and here is another very recent article where they go through data processing. You need to, so to speak, select your structure segment and you quantify. And then usually when it comes to super resolution microscopy, you usually kind of need to simulate uh, uh, a truth and compare that to estimate. And then, of course, with the new AI uh, things that are coming, a lot of that also goes to the imaging analysis. But I'm not covering that, that at all. So. So that was everything I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. So first, I would like to know if uh, you guys have questions for Hans. I think they want lunch. <laughs> it's okay. They will have lunch. <laughs> um, I I have a question about uh, first a little comment about uh, your facility. I think you are uh, since you are part of your bioimaging. We have uh, in our course six students this year who are taking the course for fully remotely from different countries, and uh, I think you also it's also possible for them to apply to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody is welcome. Just, just apply. We're trying mm -hmm. to help as good as we can. Yeah. Or we direct you to people that we know can support you more locally. Or so, if you have, a, uh, if you can think uh, about a way that your project might benefit from these separation techniques, you can uh, contact Hans and uh, and uh, and try to get your project through. And then another question that I have is actually yesterday I was imaging uh, one of the student samples that was mounted in Merviol and that was so crazy flat and yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> like really and I'm, I'm wondering what type of mounting medium do you normally recommend if someone comes to you and is flexible? Yeah that comes down then to the questions do you need to, to keep the 3D uh, topology or is it is it enough to say okay I want to localize it and say okay it sits on the mitochondria or it sits there then of course you can make a pancake or everything kind of just collapsing 
sometimes you do that anyway with your image data when you do uh, maximum intensity prediction, you kind of collapse everything. So, so it really depends on if you want to keep the 3D structure, then of course you shouldn't make it into a pancake. So, and so if you want to keep the 3D structure, what uh, mounting medium do you recommend normally? Yeah, well, I I put a, I I make everything flat because that gives me the best images, and I also try to recommend that just the flattest cell on the, on Earth. But sometimes people like other kind of biology. But the thing that is helping you is, of course, a nuclear pore complex is about two hundred, about one hundred twenty to one hundred and sixty nanometer wide and about two hundred fifty nanometer thick. So even if you kind of push that down in a fixative, it's still going to stay around that nanoscale structure. So it's more if you think about the whole whole cell as such, that you kind of squeeze that down. I mean, the nanoscale structure are, of course, affected a little bit. But yeah, I, I think they are less distorted than, than we think because they are so small mm -hmm. in the cell membrane is only 20 nanometer thick. So, and it's also kind of impossible to squeeze material too close to each other. So that part kind of kind of helps. But of course, uh, some structure will of course definitely be rearranged. Uh, if you uh, squash them down. Yeah, but then of course you also know about electron microscopy, which has 10 times or even 100 times higher resolution that I, I showed you now. They put things in uh, frozen ice or yeah, a lot of plastic methods and things like that. And there, of course, there should also be a molecular distortion. But we take that as our golden standard that compare structures to that. So there might be a slightly different native structure than, than when it's squashed into plastic or amorphous ice. But I don't know what the deviation is there. But of course, large scale, if you take just an, uh, yeah, an egg and then squash it, then of course it's along the surface and then it's not uh, round anymore. So. But if you, if you would want to preserve the 3D structure, do you have a favorite mounting medium? No, actually not. I try to like uh, flat, thin stuff. You try to flat it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> because that gives me the best image. <laughs> so so no, you should work on that part. And I also showed that slide that different uh, sample preparation uh, will, of course, affect your cell structure. So, yes. Good. I can build you a microscope. I have never made a sample, so. <laughs> yeah, we struggle with that uh, daily on a daily basis so are there more questions for hans lunch no okay well if not thank you very much hans and uh we'll see you again next year <laughs> yes okay thank you bye bye Bye, and everybody else, we're going to uh, have, uh, so we're gonna go for lunch. And uh, for those who are interested, I have actually moved the Fourier, those online, I've moved the Fourier Transform lecture to tomorrow in case you were interested. So check the latest schedule on our website. And now we're gonna go for lunch and then we will be back here on the same uh, Zoom for a short lecture, and then we will go to the other Zoom for the decomposition workshop. See you at one. If you have any comments or questions, you're welcome to ask now. Uh, actually, Sylvie, I just wanted to ask about uh, the discussion thing yeah. that I had posted. Yes. Uh, I think there was a misunderstanding because I'm, I was talking about the Microsoft role play that we're going to do on Friday. Uh, okay. You you mean uh, the stuff where the text disappeared? No, no, sorry. Um, uh, another problem I had because I was uh, I posted in the discussion that I had problems to find the extra options that one could buy when buying a microscope. Right. The extra options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't... Uh, so, okay, I understand what you mean um, for the discussion. I think it's... Uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's the, the extra options that we have discussed, basically, you know, 
this is the type of things that we have okay. discussed. Uh, so, uh, um, no, I understand. I understand now what you mean by the extra options. Maybe I need to clarify this for the next next year. And maybe I shouldn't formulate it in that way. <laughs> Okay. So, no, so what I want like is, is really you to base yourself on what we have said in the lectures. And uh, so on the material that you've had, uh, how would you, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages basically of each of the methods that we have discussed, the four methods, and then you can try to uh, defend your little uh, speech and uh, we'll see which one I want to buy at the end. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thanks.